Sam, you used to have hair that long. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And uh, it's good to be here. Spent some days here uh, during emergencies back in my days in law enforcement. Impressive room with a group of impressive people. Uh, so I want to acknowledge the presence of um, my deputy mayor for public safety, Phil Banks, uh, the entire emergency management team, folks who are around you, and look, look like we have a few new members of our team here, <laughs> and uh, standing here uh, to make what I believe is a significant announcement. But also want to uh, just first give acknowledgement as the flags are fly flying uh, half st staff today. We've lowered them uh, because we lost a member of the New York City Bravest. Uh, uh, Jesse died uh, yesterday uh, after potential heart failure. The uh, autopsy would determine the exact cause of death. Uh, but being in the hospital yesterday with his family and just seeing the impact of losing uh, one of our uh, fine members of our emergency apparatus in the city. Uh, he worked at Ladder 134 in Rockaway. Uh, he was actively firing a two-alarm fire yesterday. Uh, we don't know if that was a connection, and that determination would be made. Uh, seven years of service, and all they talked about is that all he wanted to do was to be a firefighter. And he served this city well. And uh, New York City is possible because of men and women uh, like him uh, that walk into the arena of danger to protect New Yorkers. And so I ask all New Yorkers to reflect on his life, his contribution. And remember, uh, we sit under the tree of safety because of men and women who have decided to water that tree with their blood, their commitment, and dedication uh, to the people of this city. And they deserve our gratitude, and they de deserve fine leaders. <clears throat> uh, they must have the right leaders to get the job done. And over the past few weeks, we have uh, incredible addition to our leadership team. Um, every place from the Department of Parks, our chief technology officer, uh, to uh, what we are doing in education and public safety, we continue to build a team uh, to make sure that New Yorkers are getting uh, the services that they deserve. And today we keep the momentum going with two important announcements, two important appointments. Uh, the first is our new New York City Emergency Management uh, Commissioner, uh, Jack Isco. Um, uh, as you know, Jack uh, uh, was uh, part of the team that we had when we were having to fight wars in our country. And he was there. Uh, Zach also uh, was a candidate for mayor. And we used to talk oftentimes on the campaign trail. We exchanged interactions and ideas. Uh, he, was, he was amazing as I spoke with him and just made notes that one day I hope I could work side by side with him in government. And now we're here in doing so. And I'm thrilled to have um, Zach to be here and joining uh, Christina Farrell, who was the acting uh, commissioner. Uh, she played a major role in these last few days um, as I took office to lead the city. So having them both sends the clear message that we're looking for. But also, before I bring them up, I want you to look around this place. Look at the men and women who are here. Uh, who serve this city, the state of art technology that is here in presence. Uh, no matter who's the mayor, no matter who is a commissioner, no matter uh, who's the governor or president, they get up every day and they respond to the needs of this city. And if you look at the state of the art setup, uh, coordinating all levels of government, and look at the team that come and show up every day uh, to make sure that we are protected. They have gone beyond the call of duty. Uh, long nights, long weekends, uh, missing time with their families. When I came here to visit a few weeks ago, hearing the stories of just being around the clock and responding to the needs of the city. They're showing the entire nation how to respond to not only a pandemic, but emergencies. 
And it's more than just COVID. They're dealing with snowstorms, dealing with floods, hurricanes like Ida. They're dealing with pandemics, fires and blackouts, all of the emergencies that New York respond to. Uh, we see what happens in front of the scene. Well, look at what is happening behind the scene. And we all, all of you that are here, a debt of gratitude for what you do every day, and we appreciate. I say it all the time, winners want the ball when the game is on the line. You have made it clear when the game is on the line of public safety, public protection, you want the ball in your hands, and you score the winning goal all the time, every time, and I say thank you for that. Also want to say what I have continued to say throughout the campaign, public safety and justice, they are the prerequisite to prosperity. They go hand in hand, and that is what we are going to ensure. We cannot be prosperous uh, without world-class emergency management. We need, we need to make sure that people are not only being safe, but feeling safe. They go together, and we need to have this cutting-edge state-of-the-art and build out the great infrastructure that you see here. Uh, as we talk about laying out my vision for emergency response, responding to those crises that we have faced and what we know in a big city we're going to continue to face. And what I love about this new team we, we're putting together is that the deep expertise that we already have in serving New Yorkers and putting together a new perspective, a new outlook, a new energy. And Zach knows how to lead a team. We need to be clear on that. He has done that in the most difficult moments. And actually, that may be an understatement when you think about his background. He served our nation as a combat decorated Marine Corps officer commanding U.S. troops and Iraq soldiers in the 2nd Battalion of Fallujah. He has been committed to protecting the people of this country, and now we have those talents to be committed to protect the people of this city. He's someone who lives to serve others, and we will continue to do so. And when he came home, he did more than leave his experience on the battlefield. He founded the Headstrong Project, making sure our veterans get the mental health support that they need, something that's crucial as we, we we move, we move forward in this city. Zach knows it's not only those moments of crisis, but it's continuing to be there for people in the weeks, months, years that follow. And he marries the great compassion for people with the real focus on technology, innovation, and how we can better serve. He is so ready to lead uh, this new platoon, a platoon of New Yorkers, to ensure that we are prepared in the days to come. And so now I want to bring to the podium uh, my good friend and our new commissioner. Thank you very much, Zach. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Chief Banks, thank you. I'm honored to be joining you and the remarkable team uh, that you have built. And thank you for your marks in honoring firefighter Jesse Gerhardt. Um, it is just a complete reminder of the debt this service adds to our remarkable public servants and their families. Much of what I've learned about leadership I learned in the Marine Corps. In combat, I served under some remarkable leaders. I also served under some pretty terrible ones. Uh, when I left the service, I made a promise to myself that I would only serve under leaders who led from the front, and who put their people first. And Mr. Mayor, I have no doubt that you fall into that category. Leading from the front, relentless even, especially when the cameras aren't on, willing to take ownership of the big issues facing working New Yorkers to make tough decisions instead of point fingers, it is not lost on me how lucky this city is to have you out of town. So thank you. I also want to take a moment to recognize uh, my Iraqi sisters, uh, one of whom is here with us today, uh, NYPD officers Abir and Shema al Um Their father was my translator in Iraq, and I owe him my life. Uh, public service is a tradition that runs in my family. Uh, my father came from a Gold Star family. His father worked for the city. He actually first started in the uh, Brooklyn Borough President's Office before moving to the Department of Sanitation. And my mom was one of the only white teachers to stand with her black students and colleagues during the 1968 teacher strike. 
And I'd like to thank you, Mr. Mayor and Chief Banks, for the opportunity to continue that tradition of service here at New York City Emergency Management. To the women and men here at New York City Emergency Management, thank you. Thank you for all you've done uh, for our city, especially over the last couple of years during this pandemic. Thank you for the sacrifices that you've made, and especially thank you for the sacrifices that your families have made. I told my children this morning, who are here with us today, uh, that I get to work every day now with superheroes, and I cannot wait to get started working with all of you. Throughout my career in combat, Responding to national disasters, a suicide epidemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, even in business, I've seen that government works best when it works together across city agencies, with city, uh, federal, state partners, with the private sector. And together, I know that we will be able to meet our mayor's vision to move city government upstream to address and tackle the big challenges of the 21st century. Christina, I could not ask for a better partner, a more knowledgeable and capable capable partner to do that. Thank you for enabling me to hit the ground running. Your leadership, especially over the past couple of weeks, through fires and snowstorms, has been impressive, and I know that we're going to make a great team. And Mr. Mayor, I'm not sure if you know this, but Christina and I both have four kids, so I'm pretty sure there is nothing that we will not be able to handle. And finally, to my family, uh, especially my wife, Meredith. I love nothing more than being your husband. Uh, to our children, Eloise, Wolf, India, and Wilder, there's no, no greater or more fulfilling job than being your father. Thank you for your love and support. Mr. Mayor, let's get to work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you. Uh, you know, Commissioner High School uh, will have the real opportunity to uh, come in uh, with not the typical learning curve that we have to experience uh, because he's right. Uh, Christina has been amazing, standing side by side with her at several emergencies. Uh, she has responded with a level of calmness that we expect for leaders when they're going through a particular a moment. She played a pivotal role in the emergency management team for 19 years and has been there for New Yorkers in the toughest moments. Uh, 2013 blackout, Hurricane Sandy, uh, Ebola. Many people forgot about Ebola and what it did to our city. Uh, blizzards, COVID. Uh, she has truly responded. Uh, taking the helm as acting commissioner on January 3rd, uh, she has dealt with those important moments and has been a trusted, uh, steady hand. And I'm sure her colleagues here uh, will say the same. And so I saw firsthand that calmness uh, that she presents, and I was pleased when she agreed to stay on uh, to be the first deputy commissioner uh, here. And I cannot thank you enough, uh, Christina, for what you have done for our cities and what you are going to continue to do for it. So now I want to bring up first deputy commissioner, uh, Christina Farrell. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Adams and incoming Commissioner Iskall. Uh, it has been an honor to serve the city of New York uh, for 27 years now, but for nearly two decades, 19 years at emergency management. I'm grateful for the opportunity to continue our work to help New Yorkers before, during, and after emergencies. As we all have seen over the last couple of years especially, the city's threat landscape continues to evolve, but as the mayor says, we get stuff done. I think emergency management has been getting stuff done for a really long time. Our mission and our core values would not be complete without the dedication and the hard work of our staff. Some, many who are here, you can see people working back here. We have people at our warehouse in the field and we have people asleep right now because they'll be working tonight. Uh, we have a great team of emergency managers with a wealth of knowledge and experience on how to plan and respond to emergencies here in the city. When New York City needs us, we will continue to be here. During my time at emergency management, I have had the pleasure to work under two outstanding first deputy commissioners, Calvin Drayton and Andrew Diamora. I've learned so much from both of them, and I'm excited to work with Zach and to bring my own style and my own zest for helping people to this position. I also want to thank my husband, Tim, who is here today, and our four kids, Olivia, Brendan, Cullen, and Martin, for all their support and their love. 
As the mayor said, emergency managers work long hours and emergencies certainly don't happen between Monday to Friday, nine to five. My family is used to my early morning conference calls, my staying late on Fridays, and me pulling out my computer pretty much anywhere we are to get the job done. I appreciate that they continue to be willing to share me with the city of New York. I look forward to working with our new commissioner and our entire fantastic team to bring this department to the next level. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before we open up to questions, uh, I'm going to bring on the chair of the Committee of Fire and Emergency Management, uh, good friend, Councilman Joanne Ariola. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Before I start, I just want to thank our new commissioner for his service to this country. It is truly appreciated. I stand here as a councilwoman as a, and also as the chair of Fire and Emergency Management Committee for the New York City Council. I can tell you that, that I'm so impressed, Mr. Mayor, that you really know how to blend you know, as you said, people with new perspective, with those with vast knowledge and experience. I have had the pleasure of working with First Deputy Commissioner Christina Farrell, and I look forward, Commissioner, to working with you because th you worked on the front line, right? You fought on the front line. This is the front line. OEM Command Center is the front line. This is who really helps us when there is an issue, when there is a Hurricane Sandy, when there is some type of explosion in our, in our, in our communities. You know, when there are fires that are happening, we work with our fire department, and I do send my condolences to the fire department for the loss of their member as well as his family. But here's where it all takes place. And I'm honored to be the chairperson of the committee that will help this this particular agency grow and work with both Commissioner Iskal and First Deputy Commissioner Christina Farrell. I'm honored to be the chair of the committee and, and thank you, Mayor, for the hard work that you're doing to make sure each agency is led by the right people so they can get stuff done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. Uh, this is a question for the new commissioner. Congratulations. Thank you. So talk about your learning curve. Obviously, your military experience will bring a lot to this, but you know, you've not served in police or, or fire or as an EMT. So talk about the learning curve that you'll have. Yeah, so first off, there's no doubt I'm going to be drinking through a bit of a fire hose in this position. But, you know, my career has been defined um, by seeing that government works best when it works together. And I've seen that on the front lines in Iraq. I saw that on the front lines of a suicide epidemic. I saw that on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. I've seen it responding to earthquakes and hurricanes. Um, and that is ultimately the job of New York City Emergency Management. You know, the number one mission here is coordination of city agencies and bringing people together. And that is something that I've done throughout my entire career. Uh, and it's something that I've been a student of throughout my entire career. Thank you. All right, let's go a couple of topics. All right, we're going to do three off topics. Nolan, Chris, Eric. Oh. Nolan, go ahead. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning. Um, yesterday, you talked about you know the police department's push to redeploy badge carrying officers from desk positions to the field. Uh, has the police department given you a tally on the number of badge carrying officers in those desk positions, and do you know how many of them have been redeployed so far? Uh, no, they have not. Uh, and part of the redeployment is ensuring we get the proper civilians to replace them. Uh, to fill those jobs that they're doing, and we're in the process of doing so. I know it's hard to believe, but I think we're seven weeks in, and I trust, trust me when I tell you, that's the number one commitment. Uh, many uh, mayors have attempted to accomplish that task, and they, they have been unable to do so, but trust me, I'm going to get it done. My commission is aware of that. They're doing a complete analysis, and we're going to make those, tra those trans transfers that's needed. 
there a, is there a timeline for getting it done in June into the year? Do you have some some expectation for when it'll be done? No, uh, that is too long. June is unacceptable. Of uh, the crime we're facing uh, needs immediate uh, deployment. And uh, within the next uh, few weeks, we're going to start the first wave of movement. Uh, I am not going to accept uh, June uh, during, as you know, traditionally, uh, that is time when crime is the highest. And uh, we are not going to accept that long period of time. And so you will see in the next few weeks um, some of the necessary, appropriate uh, transferring of those who are going to do uh, actual public safety on the streets. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, while we were speaking about the suspect in the uh, fatal Chinatown stabbing last weekend, you mentioned that there were loopholes in the law that you think allow this individual to remain out on the street. What are those loopholes? Uh, uh, here's, the, here's the area that I'm really concerned at, and we must revisit. Uh, not allowing family members to commit individuals who are dangerous to themselves and others. We have to really examine that. Uh, the proper expanding the definition of kindred's law on identifying someone who's dangerous to themselves or others. Uh, allowing people to uh, sleep on the streets that are dangerous to themselves or others. Uh, we need to re really re-examine how we are dealing with individuals who are showing imminent danger to themselves and others. And that is what I'm asking my team to look at and to speak with Albany uh, so that we can ensure that in areas where we must compel people to get the necessary care, uh, that we're able to do so. And on Thursday, we're going to be rolling out our plan on how we're going to deal with that in the subway system. But that is one of the major problems we're facing. And I'm sure you know when you cover some of these stories, that's the common denominator we're seeing. We're seeing people with mental health issues that are not only dangerous to themselves, but dangerous to others, and we're walking past them every day until they carry out a particular action that leads to violence to people. Specifically in this instance of the Chinatown suspect, though, how do you believe Kendra's law would have been applicable in that situation? Well, uh, I'm not sure if there was a real mental health uh, history with this gentleman that carried this crime, uh, but we need to look at that, examine that. The goal we must always do is find out when you have an action like this, let's do a deep dive and say, where were the warning signs? What should we have looked for? How are we empowering those who are at the homeless shelters to also give us the warning signs? Do they have someone there that's exhibiting violent behavior so we can get inside the homeless shelters identify the services that individuals need. That's the disconnect we have. At homeless shelters, people come in, they sleep for the evening, but if we exceed that they're exhibiting some dangerous behavior, are we reaching out proactively and saying, I have a person here that should receive some additional support because maybe the place is not a homeless shelter, that person may need to be one of our, in one of our psychiatric facilities. That's the connection that I want to make in government, not just being reactive, but proactive, and we have to train people on the front end to do so. Aaron, last question. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, can you tell us why you decided to suspend the expansion of the uh, sanitation uh, organics collection program in your budget, particularly given that on the campaign trail you uh, proposed a universal organics uh, uh, program? Um, you know, how do you square that with eliminating in the budget? Well, you know, it's a preliminary budget. Um, so there's still time. There's still time that we're going to do. But right now, Erin, it was broken. Uh, the manner in which we were carrying it out, and I reached out our environmental team and said, "Listen, we got to get a better job. We have to do it better." Uh, I just don't see how you use diesel trucks to move around the city and pick up, uh, you know, those uh, recyclable uh, food products uh, that a minimum amount of people are actually participating in. That's a broken system. And so we just can't be symbolic in addressing this issue. So my team is looking at how do we get it right? How do we maximize participation? How do we think differently? Let's see what other states and countries are doing so we can finally get it right. We did not have it right, and I want to get it right so that we won't use taxpayers' money and dollars just to do a symbolic program. And that is why we're doing this. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. All right.
Thank you. Thank you. Let me say hello to the little one. Yeah.